Oh, are we live, Dave? Did that little sound mean we're live? Oh, I don't. You you are the only one that would hear this. Sound, oh, but well. Yes, it says we are on air on the top, so we are good. To All right, go. thank you, my number one producer, Dave Veffer. And also, thank you, Dave, for putting together this special show. This is this is super different. We've never done one quite like this. These are all authors on the show today, and these are all um, you know they've done uh, uh, print and uh, and ebook type stuff. But today is specifically about all the the ebooks that they've recently done for a site called Flatbooks.com, which is sort of a, a great site for for tips and tricks and inspiration and photography and art and really all walks of life and you'll get a good cross-section of this tonight because each of these authors is going to talk about uh, kind of what they've learned and and uh, they'll show some of their books and give us some some inside secrets and this sort of thing and also we've taken the liberty of doing something special we all came together with sort of a, a quick agreement that rather than um, having to buy each person's book individually, we made a bundle. So you can get them all together at like 50% off, so it's a great deal. So you can either just go ahead and buy it now, and trust me, we always have full you know, money back guarantees if you're not happy, uh, or you can wait till the end of the show after they all talk and then, and then do it. But anyway, if you want to do that, uh, the link to go get the whole bundle is stuckincustoms.com slash Dave, what is the link? It's Flat slash books authors, I think. It's slash author bundle. Okay, so that's like the quick way to get there. But let me share my screen, and I'll show you what's happening, in case you're unfamiliar with um, uh, flatbooks.com. Let me go over here. Let me click uh, screen share. Flatbooks is awesome. I love flatbooks. Oh well. Me too, Karen Hutton. <laughs> <laughs> me too. Okay, wait. So let me share this so people see what's going on. Okay. So this is flatbooks.com. All right. And we have all kinds of different ebooks for whatever your particular interest level might be. And um, here, you know, we've got a ton of different um, authors here. We just have sort of a, a random selection tonight. In fact, there was so much interest in this. We have a, a sort of a, a private Flatbooks uh, community on uh, on Google Plus, and we had more people than we could fit into one show. So we'll probably do a second show because I think it's kind of a, a fun way for people to um, to get to know these people and just get it's a good excuse to get tips and tricks. I think. Be like so anyway, me. on any of these, um, you can click on them and you can get all kinds of details and. Um, there's all kinds of stuff that I think you'll enjoy. You'll find all kinds of great stuff. Uh, to, no matter what your interest level is or your particular area of expertise or if you just want to get better at something, I think you'll really enjoy yourself here. All right. Okay, so let me unscreen share and let's um, jump around with introductions. And we'll kind of go in, in a random order. Zany, we'll go alphabetical order uh, by the name of your book. Uh, which seems incredibly arbitrary, but why not? <laughs> so, uh, Justin, why don't you start? Oh, hey, Trey, um, all the other fellow authors, thanks a lot for having me on. Um, I wrote a book called Big World Little Lens, The Complete Guide to iPhone Photography. And um, I guess I could show a couple pages right now, give you a couple tips out of the book, a little preview. Um, I have my iPhone here, trusty iPhone, don't leave home without it. But uh, one cool thing you can learn in the book is what I call the Haas effect. And if you're looking to do maybe like a soft focus effect with your iPhone, any mobile phone, you could probably do it with your camera as well. It only works in really cold conditions, but if you blow warm air on your uh, iPhone, you're going to make a nice soft, uh, soft focus effect for portraits. So that's a little tip I wanted to share with the uh, viewers out there. And did you want me to show a couple pages from the book? Well, hold your hosses for a minute. Yeah. <laughs> what we'll yeah. do, we'll go, we'll go through introductions uh, for, first so everyone can kind of say hello so there's not all these strangers down in these squares. Right. And then we'll kind of jump into the, the tips and tricks. Sorry, I should have explained that better. Cool. Sorry about that. Yeah. I'm Justin. Next person. <laughs> yeah, but now we're, we're bonded with you. It's awesome. We love you. All right. Yeah. Well, we... Can, I, can I tell a funny story about 
Karen meeting Karen Hutton for the first time. Oh God! <laughs> I love Karen Hutton stories. Please. Okay, no! this is like this is really funny. Um, it was last year, and I was in Austin, and I went to Trey's Christmas photo walk in the the Christmas lights or whatever. And if you have stuck on the stuck on Earth app, it's kind of personalized, and Karen Hutton's voice, you know, her beautiful voice says things. So I was. In bed, my wife and I were laying there, and I opened it up to plan a trip, and it's like, hello, Justin. And she has this real seductive, beautiful voice. <laughs> and my wife's like, what the hell is that? And I was like, oh, it's stuck on Earth. I'm planning our next trip. And she didn't really understand it. And then, so we were at the, the photo walk, and I hear her voice again. I'd never met Karen. I had no idea where it came from. And, I was like, and my wife was there, too, and she's like, that's the voice. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's Karen Hutton. So I went and introduced myself. <laughs> That's my Karen Hutton story. That Good. is so funny. I remember that distinctly. That was hilarious. Yeah. And I was really glad yeah. your wife was there. She's looking at me like, do I like you? Yeah. <laughs> no, no. She, she likes you. She loves the voice. Yeah. yeah. We did good. That was fun. We, that was the wet one. We were really... Was that the rainy one? No, that was... No, no. It wasn't wet. It was just cold. Oh, this is just the Christmas one. That's right. Yep. It was cold. I yeah. That. So, yeah, that There's was the Karen Hutton story. <laughs> <sighs> Spreading joy right. wherever I go. Next, Paul, you are next. Tell us what you're all about. Hello, I'm Paul Gustan. I'm a body painter from Rhode Island. I airbrush paint on people, and then I photograph them. Cool. And I have made the book Diary of a Body Painter, and it's all about my experiences as a body painter slash photographer. Your what a cool body paint is awesome. And I'm waiting for Karen to let me paint her. <laughs> oh, man. I hope you're not holding your breath. This is going to turn into the Karen hangout. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Paul, uh, don't sorry. worry, Karen. Remember, he uses an airbrush, so yeah. it'll come out looking great. Yeah, I'll I'll do it right after Trey. <laughs> no, no one wants to see me. Body Game on. <laughs> that's what, that's what I'm saying. I'll do it right after. You. No. <laughs> All right. Okay. Next is Krista. Hi, I'm Krista Laser. I'm an intellectual property attorney at Kirkland and Ellis. Uh, you can find me at Kirkland.com. And I wrote the book Goals. It's about achievement and finding happiness with achievement. So it's fun. Very cool. And I like to take photographs too. So <laughs> I'm just learning. <laughs> and you're yes. just brilliant and gorgeous and fantastic Aww. on top of it. So you're like, you're like the entire package. You can always win my heart with flattery. Thing. <laughs> yeah. I got a million of them. And they're all true in your case. So that's awesome. <laughs> All right, next, uh, Karen, it's your turn to introduce yourself, and now you can flatter yourself. I, uh, well, <laughs> but everyone else does it so well. Um, <laughs> that just sounded weird. Okay, I'm Karen Hutton. <laughs> and Trey, you didn't actually say that I'm sort of like helping. Anyway, uh, I'm Karen Hutton, and I'm a photographer and a voiceover artist. I did the voice of Stuck on Earth. Um, I'm harassed on a regular basis in Hangouts, and I enjoy that immensely. Um, the book I We is mine. I, you know what? It's not telling you how to do anything. It's just giving you a chance to kind of kick back, relax, look at some photos, read a little story, take a break. Um, Chris McCaskill at uh, Smug Mug told me that th that's what he does during his day when he wants to take a break, when he's just tired of legalese and people and everything and just needs a time out. He picks up my book and takes a few pages in and he says I feel refreshed I'm ready to go so there you go oh, that's a nice endorsement from him uh huh he was a sweetheart to tell me that it was really great and Karen uh, five seconds before the show started you um, you unofficially agreed to be my co-host for this episode I think it was more like a minute and a half before <laughs> really. and, that's right uh, I'm, I'm doing my best I, uh, thank you you're welcome Anytime. yeah you're doing great so far okay next yeah. Uh, Joseph. Howdy, howdy. I am Joseph Lanashki, or Photo Joseph. Uh, you can find me photojoseph.com and Photo Joseph on pretty much all of the socials. I wrote the ebook on Flatbooks called Killer Tips for Getting the Most Out of Your Canon Camera, and my ebook does not feature Karen Hutton, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> There's always the iBook. <laughs> <laughs> There's always time. Okay, now, Troy. You, Troy, with the most awesome lighting setup. Of all, which fits in is. perfectly with the topic of his book. Yeah, my name is Troy Pava. I'm uh, the author of the book Light Painted Night Photography. Uh, I run a website called LostAmerica.com. Uh, teach workshops and publish and do all kinds of work and all kinds of different media. And I'm a painter and 
all kinds of crap. So I'm always working on something. Always got my fingers up to my elbows and something. We didn't do our websites. What's your website, Troy? Lostamerica.com. You said that. Very good. Did everybody else do theirs? <laughs> well, if they didn't, also. they can do it when we circle back around in them. And I'm going to be especially listening to Troy because tonight, Tom, I'm pointing the camera over there, Tom. Are you ready? Tom, who you can see is uh, in Mine full is relaxation mode right there. Uh, Tom Anderson! What, what are you so, doing? Uh, Tom and I are going to go out tonight and do a little night photography. So cool. We, uh, Outstanding. I wish yes. everybody went out and did night photography. Yeah, so uh, we, Excellent. we're we going to be experimenting, so we'll listen to your, your hot tips. What are you going to experiment with? What are you going to try? What are you thinking? Well, I don't, I don't know what we're going to do. Tom, I don't know if you follow him on Instagram or not, but no. he, um, he's big into Instagram. Uh, mm. And he, has, uh, he put up a cool photo that I liked. He took with a, a fisheye. Actually, you didn't take it, did you? No, my friend took it of me. It was quite rare for me to put up someone else's photo. Yeah, so he, he put up someone else's photo uh, with a fisheye lens with sort of this silhouette on the bottom and... I'm not going to try to describe it, but anyway, it was really cool, and it made me think, oh, I'd like to try something like that. So, yeah, get, yeah, get out and do some night shooting, man. What time is it there? What is it, about 7 in the morning or something? No, it's only three hours earlier than California here, so it's 4.18 p.m. right now. Yeah, but, but it's, it's, it's the middle of summer, so it doesn't actually get dark here until about, like, really dark, until, like, 11 p.m. Right. Wow. So you kind of got to stay up late to get some night shots. Hey Trey, right. did you want to uh, see that photo you're talking about? Oh, there it is. Oh, let's see. That's wow. it right there. So actually, you know, it's uh, really cool. Uh, turn that yeah, upside awesome. down, if you can, and it it looks like the Earth, doesn't it? It does. Yeah. Oh yeah. I don't know if other people can see that, but I think that's, that's cool. in very focus. Cool. Dallas uh, Nagata White dropped that bomb on Tom. Boom. And I thought that was a really cool. <laughs> Ah. Cool. That's awesome. right on. The, idea the, photographer's name is John Hook. the photographer's name is John Hook. Tom Watt. Can you hear him when he talks? Uh, yeah. Hey, a little bit. Yeah. Hey, tell him. Oh, never mind. Would you like me to relay a message to Tom? <laughs> no, no, no. It was weird. Okay. I, uh, I'm friends with his uh, Thomas O'Brien, and, and I saw him pop up on Facebook, so I was like, oh, I'll send a face request, Facebook re friend request to Tom Anderson. It was weird. Aha, uh -huh, okay. Well, Justin, you can keep this uh, this confusing line of thought going as you continue <laughs> talking about your tips and tricks in your book. Now? Or did you want yeah. to finish the rest now, of the office? Now, now, time. <laughs> okay, yes. Yeah. Hosses. Hosses. Go, 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 go. <laughs> right on. Well, like I said, Stop. I wrote the, the, the book, Big World, Little Lens. I'll show a couple uh, uh, pages of that. Uh, let me think of another tip that I could throw out there. Practical tip, I think, is what I want to throw out. And this is for photographing uh, cats. Everybody <laughs> loves a good cat photographing tip, right? <laughs> um, or any, but any fast-moving object. Um, yeah, the shutter release on your iPhone uh, is actually when you release your finger, not when you press the button. Simple trick, but it helps with moving objects. I tried to get a cat next to me to jump through a ring of fire tonight, but he wasn't into it. But um, I'll go ahead... What's that? You just throw him through it. No, no. It didn't look like you jumped through it when you think it. <laughs> right, right. So um, I guess I could show you a couple um, um, pages from the book if you want me to do a quick screen share. Is that all right with you, Trey? Is that the, the plan yes, of attack? Yes, please. Yeah, I want uh, everyone to share a few pages out of their book. So uh, I'm, in, uh, I'm in Bridge here, and I'll go with a slideshow, but I, I think that'll – I'm not sure about screen sharing, so I'll just go ahead and fire up uh, – one of the pages. Sure, you bet. And is that uh, showing? Yeah, you see, we see uh, that. All right. Yes. And I, I, I kind of this is one of the intro pages, and I, I thought it was important to talk about my obsession with iPhone photography. And uh, my my first couple photos I shot with my iPhone were, like I said, a cat or a dog or just something random. But then I was out on a bike ride, and I shot this photo, and and I was, you know, really happy about editing it and being able to capture these moments in my life. 
But the cool thing about it was being able to share it like instantly with, you know, obviously I'm not sharing it with millions of people like Trey, but being able to share it with my friends and family. And I thought that was really cool and kind of an empowering thing. So that started about four years ago, my obsession with the, uh, the iPhone. And since then I've become this, you know, closet evangelist for mobile photography. So I decided to write a book on it. I wrote a tutorial on it. It's on my site and it got viewed a whole bunch of times. So I decided to write a book and then, um, now it's up there with flat books. So if I close this screen, are you back to me? Yes. Yes, sir. All right. I'll show you another book. Oh, this is a this is a good this is a good page from the hey, book. Wait, by the way, Justin, I'm going to interrupt you with a question. Yeah, yeah, no, no sweat. Your adoring audience. Are you ready? <laughs> Let me share my screen because I'm also going to use this as an opportunity to show people that are watching how you can ask questions live. We use this cool thing called Google Moderator. Perfect. I know I say this every week, but we get new new viewers all the time, so I want to explain it. So I'm going to screen share here. So this is stuckincustoms.com. This is where we we uh, we embed the player there, and we have this thing called Google Moderator here. Okay, and uh, anyone come ask a question. All right. Or if you maybe don't have a question, you can vote up and down other questions. So the most popular ones turn to the top. Here's a question from Jacob Lucas for you from Seattle. For you, Justin. He says, <laughs> where can I buy an awesome cowboy hat like Justin's? Jacob. Tell him it, tell, can you, is it, oh, if, if Jacob's listening, tell him at the next North by Northwest uh, photo jamboree, I'll bring him one. All right. <laughs> He'll know. It's, is it hard to travel with those? That's a big effort because you got to put it in It's a, special, a big effort. A yeah. think tank makes a special case for it. Think Tank makes cases for hats? <laughs> no, I'm just joking. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so it's like, no, well, no. I, I didn't know they were in that business. No, no, I actually kind of wore it for you so you could kind of harken back to your Austin days, Trey. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. All right, you can go on with your next page share. Cool. And this one's kind of an important one for, for, uh, for me. Hopefully it is for everybody else. Karen might appreciate this because it's from San Francisco. Oh, look at that. Can you see that photo? Oh, right? my God. So I was in San Francisco a couple years back, maybe if, if Thomas Hawk's out there watching. Um, That's awesome. And I, I used to run a, in the mornings along the Embarcadero, and I had my phone with me again, and I, I shot this photo, and I was there for like a week, and for a week I tried to capture the same photo with my Nikon and never could. So it's just a reminder that, you know, the cliche, it's the, it's the photo <laughs> or the camera you have with you. But... Um, you know, I just, I just love, again, I continue to fall in love with iPhone photography and mobile photography and kind of the cool moments that it, it creates in your life and you can capture. And this was one of them that I tried to replicate but just couldn't. So Yeah, you know what you should do? That's such an awesome photo. You should make another ebook and have that be the cover. And the title of the ebook can be How to Get This Kind of Photo with Your iPhone. And then there can <laughs> only be one page inside that totally. says, Don't worry, you never will. <laughs> Don't worry. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. Price yeah. at twenty nine dollars. <laughs> right. Yeah. Mother Nature never gives you a second chance. So, um, and then I'll have I have one more um, one page I'll show you here, and this is a uh, another kind of tip, but it also features your app there, Trey. Oh. Um, and I f I figured it was timely with the whole Instagate that was going on. Yes. Right. So when Instagram went like nuts with their terms of use. And the whole world erupted, and you know, uh, one of the recommended apps was um, 100 Cameras in One, one of the Stuck and Customs apps. So one of my pages features it as a, a way to extend Instagram. You know, you can apply these cool filters. I think you shot like a thousand different filters or textures around the world. Is that right, Trey? Yes, that's correct. So they're all packaged in here, and you can add a lot of them. But uh, one thing I wanted to point out with these textures is they work really well when you're applying them to these kind of silhouetted scenes that are more focused on shapes and tones and not necessarily on um, non-shaped and tone high contrast <laughs> images. So <laughs> anyways, I hopefully, uh, hopefully I, um, you guys go out and check the book out. It's, it was a fun, fun write, and it's got a whole bunch of information in it, plus it's got a, a gallery of about 100 images shot around the world with an iPhone, so that's, those are my, my pages that I wanted to share. That's cool. fantastic. Well, that was awesome, Justin. Thank mm -hmm. you. Right on.
Yeah, Karen, doesn't well, he make for... you want to go out and shoot with your iPhone? It, well, I've been doing it more, and I, you know what? I have Justin's book, and I've looked through it. I haven't read it cover to cover. It's fantastic. But oh, you're reminding you. me that there were some pages I had kind of bookmarked for myself. I went, I've got to go back to those. Now you're reminding me. i got to go back to those. Right on. I got, yep. Because I actually shoot a fair amount with my uh, mobile phone. Yeah, you started going heavy with your mobile phone down in uh, Moab or Utah when you're on a trip. I thought last year I saw a yeah, bunch of good photos. Yeah, because I'm not that fast. From... I'm not that fast to process and you know get things all yeah. turned around. So hey, there's yeah. the phone. <laughs> right on. Is this, is it specifically geared towards iPhone or can it be used with you know, a mobile phone? It, 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 there's a tip section in there that gives ten like basic photography tips for people that are new to photography that would be uh, applicable to a lot of it but you know some of it talks about the whole first chapter talks about ways to like organize and kinda um, excuse me that's the second chapter the first chapter talks about um, basically all the features of the iPhone so it is pretty iPhone specific I've had a lot of questions and I don't have a droid so I can't comment on on its uh, translation yes okay cool now next um, is Paul all right. Yeah, so like I said earlier, I'm a body painter, and this book is all about my experiences as a body painter. Um, one thing I want to mention beforehand is body painting generally has a, a, a bad reputation. People often associate it with uh, Fantasy Fest and, you know, martini glasses painted on breasts and cheetahs. And I, I, I know I've, I've met a lot of, <laughs> I've met a lot of photographers. <laughs> I've met a lot of photographers who have written it off. And... Uh, I want to I want to tell you now before you do that take a moment to see my my ebook because it's totally different from from what you might be familiar with. Uh, let me screen share the cover here. Yes, and also let me interrupt you right ahead right away and I think um some people might think oh, I'm never going to do any body painting. I'm not going <clears> to <throat> or take pictures of it. Why would I need an ebook? But I really recommend reading many many ebooks from various different artistic fields because you'll end up learning things and accidentally integrating them into your photography or whatever your particular milieu is. So, you know, sometimes uh, you don't have to be totally practical in what you read. Just go for something that's on the periphery of it and you'll end up getting ideas quite by accident. So anyway, absolutely. go on. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah, and that, that also lends itself like a, a lot of my philosophies I write about in in my books, and and that when you have a creative uh, motivation, creative endeavors, you know, it, it it's it's the same for everybody to face your fears and practice techniques and go for what you're unfamiliar with, and mm -hmm. and that helps you become better at whatever it is you're doing. And that's how I got where I am, basically. But. I'll go through these pretty quick. This is the cover, Diary of, Diary of a Body Painter. Um, like, pr they pretty much include... Uh, uh, s this one has, I think, 80-plus of my images, and then, uh, you know, so on, on one side of the page will be an image, and then another side would be a, a write-up, which would be a little story or or an experience that I had. Um, candid, candid experiences. And there's some pretty good ones. I've had some pretty wild stories, and they're all included here. And, and as you can see here, it includes... Males and females, all shapes and sizes. Uh, I talk about you know everything that goes into body painting, including uh, the the makeups that I use. In this case, it's phosphorescent and uh, black light makeup. Um, and then this is one of the early chapters, which talks about uh, facing um, setting up a photo shoot against Mother Nature. This was. Uh, there was a huge storm when I did this outdoor photo shoot, so I talk a lot about the preparation that goes into accomplishing a project when you're when you're dealing with bad weather. Uh, and then, last but not least, I wanted to plug this special um, teaser ebook that's available on my Flatbooks page, Diary of a Body Painter. But this is like a, a prequel, Diary of a Body Painter Prelude, and it's completely free, uh, no strings attached. You can download it right off of, right off of Flatbooks right now for free. So. <laughs> and this That's one is awesome. its sort of along the same lines. It's like an additional 10 chapters at no charge at all. That's, that's a great deal. Awesome. Great. Can't beat it. Awesome. That's cool stuff, man. I dig your hey. work. I like it. I do, too. Cool. Aaron, He'll when I see it. stuff like that, I see stuff like he does, I think, oh, he's like a real artist. I feel so lazy <laughs> just taking photos. I know. <laughs> I know. Me too. I'm like, God, isn't there something more I can do with my stuff? <laughs> 
Yeah, I know. It's like that's what real artists do. Thanks, guys. Yeah. yeah. A proper so, artist. Yeah. It's unique. You're right. There's no cheetahs. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's very, it's very, um, you know, cliche. Cheetahs are very cliche. That's not to say they can't be done well, but they've just been done so much, so often that. It's just you like need a, to reinvent. Sounds the like it's a challenge, man. You got to throw that, yeah. throw the gauntlet down on that. <laughs> got to do Cheetah uh, well. Cheetara from uh, Thundercats yeah. or something. Well, I, I mean that's been done too. That's like a lot of stuff has been done a lot, and I always, I always try to either do something completely original or do it better than it's ever been done. And Chitara has been done by a really great body painter friend of mine, and it's, it was done very well. And I don't know how much better I could make it, honestly. <laughs> I guess you'll just have to do Panthro instead. Right. <laughs> That'd be a little bit easier, too. Save me some time. <laughs> okay, nerds, just a minute. We're going to take a break <laughs> from that talk where you're making uh, aloof references to Edge and to see cartoon characters. Thundercats. Jump back into the real world. Just a laser. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you have to go to the left brain person for the real world jump, right? <laughs> yeah, let's go to an intellectual property lawyer who doesn't know anything about <laughs> these sorts of geeky things. No, I, I love Paul's work, so that's, I mean, that's great. Um, but, uh, yeah, so I guess I'll jump right into, into my book. Let me screen share. Um, all right. Can you see it okay? Yes. yes. All right, so um, my book is a little bit different from the others because it's all text, wah wah. So, um, <laughs> but, um, beautiful text, though. Beautiful text. Yeah, beautiful text. you should have put some some uh, body painting <laughs> cheetah photos in there. Yep. That would have spiced it up a little. Yeah. And what are you so, calling a cheetah? <laughs> I know cheetah. I wrote the whole thing. <laughs> and like so, cheetah. actually, one of the things that I wanted to do with this book was to mark this transition point in my own life between going after the numbers all the time and all of my achievement and trying to find out what was the purpose behind some of the things that I wanted to do. Um, you know, should you pursue goals that are just about success or should you pursue, pursue goals that do something else like contribute to your happiness or increase your personal excellence and things like that. And so I looked a little bit into the research over one uh, Christmas break where I had some some other assignments um, you know picking up my brain and just took breaks in, at midnight you know to go look at these studies and I found that a lot of happiness um, is uniform across all humans and I found that really fascinating you for example um, a lot of happiness can be determined by needs like social satisfaction and um, autonomy and respect and mastery. And the most important of these are autonomy and mastery once you've met your basic needs, which most people in the Western world have. So I realized for myself that pursuing success on its, for its own right wasn't going to make me that much happier. Um, pursuing mastery was. And so I made an effort to pursue things that regardless of what it was, was going to give me that sense of mastery. So photography was one thing that I that I just started picking up, you know, about a year ago around this time. And uh, it's really given me um, this, uh, you know, positive feelings to slowly improve in something. And I've certainly felt that way about the law as well, making sure that I'm, um, you know, mastering the law rather than just trying to climb up the ladder. And I, you know, I think that's the way to achieve success in the long run anyway, but that shouldn't be your goal. Anyway, so um, another thing that they found was that money doesn't buy happiness, but people with money tend to be happier only because they have more autonomy. When you control for autonomy, they're not any happier. So I, I found that, you know, I just started working um, about a year and a half ago, and I realized that, you know, you have to plan some way to use your money rather than rather than just uh, spending it on whatever you want, you know, use your money for something that contributes to your happiness, like increasing your autonomy. Anyway, I've gone too far, but you can read the rest in the, in the book. It's on Flatbooks. So, uh, yeah. That's, that's that. great. That's something every, every young person, you know, who's trying to figure out how to, how to be in the world and accomplish in the world really needs to know and really needs to think about. I think I commend you. I think that's oh, great. Thanks. Could I fire off a question to you? Yeah, please. Yeah, that... Uh, the first point of uh, that you meant in the pursuit of happiness, the, the it was the pursuit of mastery, not the achievement of mastery, right? 
Right, and so actually it's it's both. Um, so when you're in, when you have a state of mastery, right. you go into what's called flow more often, and uh -huh. flow contributes to um, recent positive experiences much more, which is one aspect of happiness. Um, there are three aspects of happiness that these re researchers tend to study. There's life satisfaction, recent positive experiences, and the absence of recent negative experiences. Oh. Uh -huh. And having flow contributes to that sense of recent positive experience. And having mastery also contributes to life satisfaction. When you look back and you say, I've done something well, I've worked hard to get there. Hmm. I just worried with photography because it seems like we're always <laughs> pursuing mastery. We never achieve it, you know? And so I just pursuit, want to make sure. Yeah, the pursuit certainly, certainly helps. And one thing that it does actually is um, every time that you achieve a small goal, you um, increase your release of dopamine, which can increase recent positive experiences. So getting a great photo, posting yeah. it, you know, that gives you that dopamine rush, and that can be good for you, as long as you don't overdose. Right. Hmm. There's Karen, the how are your dopamine thing. levels? <laughs> <laughs> well, they're right where they should be, Trey. How are yours? <laughs> oh, I think mine, mine are <laughs> going up reversal. right now. Oh, oh. look who's here! <laughs> Touche, Karen. This is uh, this is Scarlet. Hello, Hi, Scarlet. Scarlet. Hello. <laughs> are you doing good? I get to meet Scarlet <laughs> in a, in a mere couple of weeks. Yes, actually, do you know? See that woman right there? She's going to come. Stay in this cottage right here. Mm -hmm. She is. Well, now she very looks nice. worried. Don't look yeah. so worried. <laughs> she, <laughs> must, she might even bring candy. Mm. But you know one way that she'll bring candy for sure? Do you want to do a little bit of Gangnam Style? Oh. <laughs> no? Oh, my God. Are you sure? And like block see it. tree. No? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Hey, there's a question here for you, Karen. Yes? This is from... Uh, oh, it scrolled off the screen. I'm sorry. Where is it? Okay. This is from seanberry.me. See, Sean, I said your name right this time. <laughs> from Tribuco Canyon, California. He says, Karen Hutton, yes. I hope to meet you at the Festival of Color in a few months. Yes. Are you going to be there? I think so. So far, oh. it looks that way. Oh. That's the end of March. Yes, it'll be there soon. Yes, we might have right. a we might have a whole uh, whole little event going on there. Yes, the well, event might be bigger now. than the festival. Hmm. <laughs> you want to stay for a while? Okay. Here's a uh, here's two interrelated questions. One is this is from Stout Logger in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, KL. Uh, it says, Trey, I see you are obsessed with the horses in Iceland, but have you ever spent quality time trying to shoot a cat? <laughs> the answer is no. I don't think I have any. I've, I have zero cat photos in my port. I do I like you. cats. I just haven't really. I think I'm like. I would like to reinvent the cat photo, and I just haven't figured that out yet. <laughs> you need to. You got to make a do. jump through a fiery hoop. That's exactly the way. Yeah. That's the key. <laughs> And you can write a tutorial about it. Become an SEO powerhouse. I got one you can throw through those firing hoop right now. <laughs> yeah. hoop. I would, I would like on, to uh, get, get Tibby through a fiery hoop and have an accident. And oh, then no. photograph that. <laughs> yeah. You're going you're gonna to start an avalanche, an avalanche of hate mail. You be careful. Yeah. Tibby has a following. Yeah, Everybody no mail Trey a Tibby cat. claims to have a following, but I, I think it's all, I don't, I don't really believe it. <laughs> now here's another cat related thing. Ready? Uh, yeah, Pedro. This is from Texas Bob in Mansfield. He says, Speaking of cat photos, did y'all know that today is National Dress Your Pet Day? No. I didn't know that. <laughs> no, I didn't know that either. Yeah, he, I should have got a pet a for today. In Mansfield. I knew that. Just kidding. I didn't know uh, that. You knew that, Paul? <laughs> no, I didn't. <laughs> Paul, you should pets, Paul? you should start airbrush your pet day. That's what Paul should so do. So you get Peter knocking on my door all the time. Yeah. I'm like, no, I'm not Trey Redcliffe throwing cats <laughs> through fire. <laughs> Jeez. Painting them first. Like, they got nine lies. So. <laughs> yeah. 
Wow. Okay, Karen, you're yes? next. Oh, marvelous, marvelous. I shall endeavor to... You're the first author to use a, a pipe in your title. A pipe? That's what that thing is called. Between, it is? between oh, I, yes. pipe, we. That's Maybe that's pipe? what programmers call it. What, what, what does everyone else call it? Pipe. Whoa. I call it a pipe. A pipe. I was, really? I was lost, too. I had no idea. She has a pipe delimited title. Yeah, wow. it's a pipe. Can you, Can you see it? That's a pipe? Yeah. yeah. What did you call it? Smoking. A line. I call it a, I call it a slashy thing that's straight. <laughs> <laughs> separator. That's what I call it. Yeah. yeah, so this is this is the cover of my book. Enough about you. Now I'm now I'm on to I and we. <laughs> oh, this is the cover of my book, I we. I called it this because it's a bunch of photos that I loved and places I've gone that I've had wonderful experiences and had marvelous stories occur to me when I was there. And uh, ah. I just thought it would just be nice to um, put together a book of of like, this is my view, this is my story, what's yours? You know, maybe you, you'll just sit and relax with this and enjoy it over a cup of hot cider by a fire. Or maybe uh, maybe you'll think of your own little stories and whatnot. And uh, so, I mean, really, it's a storybook for adults, I guess, crazy people <laughs> like me. Um, this one, um, and some of them are longer, obviously, the little stories are longer. I could read that to you. That one has an accent. I know you like accents, Trey. Do it. You want to hear it? Anything to hear your voice, Karen? Bring it. All right. I'm going to read you a story about Princess Dahlia. Oh. Yes. For a snippet of time, she lived on her family's estate in Bouchard Gardens, Victoria, B.C. In the bloom of her youth, Princess Dahlia was the envy of all who happened by. She favored the front and center position, greeting visitors who arrived in Bermuda shorts from the land of ooh and ah. This is regularly... sounding a little, let me, sorry to interrupt, it's going a little Fifty Shades of Gray. But oh, go on. Just... <laughs> yeah, there was what? that one line. Yeah. Button it, Ratcliffe. Button it, Ratcliffe. Button it. I'm sorry, go back into dream Zip sequence, it. okay? Going back. Tom's probably egging you on. Tom, you be quiet too. <laughs> who regularly expressed their delight at her extraordinary beauty and countenance. She loved it when they expressed their delight. The snippet of time passed by quickly, however, as snippets of time are wont to do. The, breath the breathtakingness that was Princess Dahlia waned and faded and eventually passed completely. Yet she did live on in an online photo gallery owned by one of the visitors from the land of Ooh and Ah, who, although she didn't wear Bermuda shorts, oohed and awed with the best of them as she captured the frames that led to the digital magic that meant Princess Dahlia would live forever. And I just thought that's kind of what we all do. We make these moments live forever. So I love that. I love that. And I love that there's this perspective from the flower, too, because it makes it less sad that, you know, she might yeah. be gone. Or exactly. Trey, what, would it, what would it take for, for your team to, to get a little play button on her ebook that'll have her voice read it? Yeah. I'm actually <laughs> talking, you know what, I'm actually, I'm actually, that's actually something I'm working on, so. <clears throat> oh, I, think that would be I love your voice. Thank you. I'm a sucker for it. <laughs> I just, I love stories. I grew up listening to stories on, you know, old time radio and my mother used to read stories and and <clears throat> we all just had such vivid imaginations. My sister's an artist, and so she worked, you know, in a visual medium. So I think it just was born out of that, plus the photos, you know, from our family way back to the 1800s. So every time I take the camera out, it's story time. <laughs> and uh, so it was really fun to put it in a book that, um, that people could just kind of kick back and relax and read and look at pictures. Hey, Karen, there's a question here coming in. Hey. So Dave and I are still watching questions on, if you just tuned in, if you go to stuckincustoms.com, we have Google Moderator, and people can ask questions there and vote up and down questions. Here's, this is the top voted question, this is for you, Karen. Mm -hmm. Are you ready? <coughs> this comes from um, your friend to the north in Canada, your country friend. I don't know mm. if the person's your friend. This is uh, from Malisha Knight from Edmonton, Canada. And Malisha asks, uh, Karen, 
Yes. Do you find it hard to capture a good winter HDR shot? Gray skies seem to suck the life out of my HDR. What is your secret? So I guess she's inferring that the life hasn't been sucked out of mine. That's awesome. Um, you know what? There's a few things I do. One, if the sky is really boring and just if it's that flat white gray with nothing going on in it, I try to avoid it altogether. Um, if I cannot avoid it, um, of course, if it has some clouds and some depth, that'll the HDR will bring that out. Um, and if I can't get rid of it, I will either try some uh, neutral density in post processing or um, textures. Sometimes I will do that, um, but mostly I try to avoid them <laughs> if they're really bad. Uh, can I pipe in there for a second? Sure. If you can, you should watch. Uh, I watched your Google Plus Hangout from Nick Software, and that was awesome because you had that waterfall shot. And that mm -hmm. would be a good example for her to watch if she can find it. That's one of the photos I'm going to share tonight. Oh, that was a great photo, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I, went, I was actually down there most of the day today shooting some cool. more. <clears throat> Very cool. Uh, so you have something else to share, Karen, you said, yes? Uh, something else to share. What was I going to share? I thought you said you, you just said you were about to share a photo. Yes. Oh, well, that's when we share our photos. Ah, during later I can time. do that now, or we can do it at the appropriate time. No, no, no. We, can, we, can, we can save that bit and just let's, let's jump to Joseph. All righty. Hello, hello. We have many Canon up. people watching. In fact, I, <laughs> I guess 50% of the audience are, are Canon people, so they want to hear your killer tips. 50%. Wow. All right, well, here's, here's my book. Uh, it's titled Killer Tips for Getting the Most Out of Your Canon Camera. And the first thing I'll point out is that even if you're not a Canon shooter, still at least 90% uh, of this book is uh, is totally valid to you. So basically the book is is kind of a photography 101, but it was based around the Canon. So let me just pick up a, a couple of favorite pages in here. Uh, everything in here was shot specifically for the book. So there's lots of tips on things like just how to hold and carry your camera. And this is one of my favorites. It's yeah, As you can see, it's titled, Don't Be a Chimp. You know, it's if you're looking down at the back of your camera all the time, you're going to miss something. So my advice there is always to... You check it, make sure that your exposure is right, but once you've got the basic setup, just shoot and stop looking at the back of your camera. Um, you know, it's just so easy to miss things if you're, if you're always looking down there. Another one of the tips in here is about stabilizing the camera. So obviously we can't always hold the camera really steady, especially if we're in a low light situation, but you don't always have a tripod with you. And it's amazing what you can find to stabilize your camera, whether it's a water glass or you see you're propped up on a fork or something or sitting on top of a bottle. There's just always ways to stabilize your camera. So that's just a little little thing in there. Um, the book goes into, into all the different program modes and the various modes of your camera. P is not for perfect is a tagline I picked up from an old university professor. Um, you know, we you got to get those cameras out of the program mode. And so for those who are new to DSLRs, who this cam who this ebook was pretty much targeted at, uh, someone with a, a brand new shiny Canon DSLR and wants to get out of the program mode, this is a big part of the book. So huge part of it, just getting it out of program and going through all the different modes in here. It also talks about how to learn from the various cartoon modes. So you've got the you know, the portrait mode and landscape mode and so on. And they're not not completely useless. It's uh, it's great. It's a great way to learn in there. And there's things in here about uh, shutter speed, for example. Of course, there's aperture as well, but like in the shutter speed example uh, on the screen now, we talk about using the wrong shutter speed. So here's some examples of you know, here's a too fast of a shutter speed on a race car. You can't tell that it's moving, and too slow of a shutter speed on this this soldier here, where it's everything's blurry. So it talks about shutter speed and appropriate uh, appropriate choices there. And the last page I'll pull up is the histogram. Not the most exciting thing in the world, but if you learn how to read a histogram, you know whether your exposure is right or wrong uh, you, as soon as you shoot it. And if you're adjusting it in post, you got to know how to read a histogram to make sure that you have a well-exposed image. So there's all kinds of great details like that in the book. And, uh, yeah, I think, it's, uh, I think the book works out pretty well. It's, uh, it's fun. It shows a lot of different things in photography and, and just a general photo tips and all that good stuff. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you, Joseph. Much more people read books like that instead of going out and trying to figure out what they're doing in the field and they're just completely lost all the time. It's a good starting point, for sure. And I, I've had people who are you know, not beginner photographers say that they even picked up a few things from it. And so, you know, considering the cost of the books, even if you're a well-seasoned photographer, it can't hurt to learn a new thing along the way, and you never know what you'll learn. Great point. So true. Uh, hey, here's a question that just came in uh, from New Zealand. This, uh, where did it go? I lost it. 
Oh no. Um, the question was something about they wanted interactive or they were curious about um, interactive ebooks and uh, you know if you could actually play with them or or if we could make some of those or why don't we make some of those or something I'm actually working with Griffin a little bit on that. Are you? Yes. Yeah, so the sh the short answer is is that uh, for the for the most part uh, we just do very simple PDFs because I think that most people don't want um, interactivity in their ebooks. They just want to read. And a simple PDF can go right onto your iPad or computer. It's simple. And you can just absorb the information at the pace you want to absorb it. I think that's the vast majority of the market. So we keep it very, very simple. And also, as soon as you start to add a little bit of interactivity, even just a tiniest bit, it really ramps up the complexity just out the wazoo. So I've always been a fan of just um, simplicity in this case. But I'm glad that uh, uh, there is a bit of interactive stuff going on. Um, all right, so um, who was next in our list here? So that was Joseph. Okay, that Troy. question was from uh, Nick in Napier, New Zealand, by the way. Yes, Nick in Napier, New Zealand. That's sort of a problem with that moderator. Every now and then I have yeah. a question that's on there, and then a new one comes in and pushes it down. I lose it. Maybe there's a different way to view Dave. Am I doing something wrong? Uh, no, you're not doing anything wrong. Okay. So, Troy, I'll, there's a few questions in moderator for you. I'll ask you one, and you can just sort of answer it while you're in the middle of showing your okay. stuff here. Let me, Shoot, I'll do my best. Let me find it. Um, let me jump over here. And this one is from Derek Kind in Ottawa, Canada. It says, question for Troy. If you had to choose just one light painting implement to take with you on a night shoot, what would it be? Question mark, smiley face. <laughs> well, I've been using this new flashlight that uh, just hit the market uh, not too long ago called the Proto Machine. Let me get What's back it called? The, uh, it's called a Proto Machine. Uh, P -R -O -T -O. I'm, I'm using right here to do this blue light that's in my office right now. I don't know if you can see this, but it's Whoa. a... It's a flashlight with uh, a handle on it. It weighs a couple pounds. It's got preset colors in it. It's got programmable colors in it. Every color is 100% hue adjustable. So I can turn this knob and, and slowly rotate through from yellow to green to blue. I can then take those hues and desaturate them to white. And I can also change the intensity of the light. Whoa. All in this one thing. It's an amazing that tool. That is cool. Yeah, now, I, I've, I've been lucky enough to be, become the like, beta, te beta tester for these guys. There's actually one guy who builds them in his garage. Um, but uh, it's an amazing light painting tool. Uh, as far as light painting tools go, that was it. I mean, a couple years ago, I would have said the AA mag light. You know, it's like the old yeah. workhorse light painting tool. But this thing is amazing. It's, an, it's a really an amazing Amazing can you put a snoot on that thing? Yeah, you can. Um, I, I use my own snoots. I make a. I have cardboard snoots that I yeah. use that are uh, like a roll from. Uh, the one I have is a roll from a, a bolt of fabric. Oh, okay. So a, I don't have it handy right now, but it's a it's a cylinder. I mean, a lot of people buy the the uh, the third party like collapsible, foldable ones and all that. Right. But I, I like the the cylindrical one because it's a cylinder. So when you're lighting yeah. something, I can do a nice spherical shape, uh, you know, light with it, rather than I find with the collapsible ones, they get kind of all scrunched, and you have this, like, L-shaped light instead of a circular one like maybe you want, you know? They seem a cool. little harder to control. So in, in, to make a long story short, yes, you can snoot it. Yes. So it's, it's, uh, it's like, replaced everything. I mean, it I, I had... I used to have a whole pocket full of, of flashlights and LED flashlights and incandescent flashlights and xenon flashlights because each one had a different color cast. And with that thing, it's all, every color cast is in there. It's an amazing tool. Protomachines.com. So, that, Very you know, cool. I, I don't, he's been sold out of them for a while. They're 500 bucks. They're not cheap. But, uh, you know, buy that instead of a lens is what I can tell you to do. You know, it's a cool thing. Anyway, let me go back to the book here. 
Yes. Got to, to bump that out. Let me go back to the screen share here. This will just take a sec. I promise. So anyway, this is the cover of the book. Are you guys seeing that? Negative. No. Nine? Come on, baby. Share your desktop. <clears throat> I don't yeah. know if you're sharing. There you go. There it is. Okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is the cover of the book. Um, I'm, uh, I've been doing this for 20, almost 25 years now. It's basically the only kind of photography I do is, is knife photography. Uh, and all my lighting is generally done with handheld flashlights. I do use strobes sometimes. Uh, mostly I do that for portraiture now uh, because it's hard to, to light uh, a figure with a continuous source light like this where you hold a light on for 10 seconds. If you blink, you get these blurry, weird-looking eyes. And so that's really the only time I use strobe at this point. Um, I'll just kind of click through a couple of pages here. There's, uh, I think, uh, 50 images in the book, um, and I go into depth with how each one was done um, and uh, the techniques that were used and my, the reason why I made the choices that I made for composition and, and color and, and that type of thing. Uh, it also gives a pretty good cross-section of different types of locations that I get into. This is a, uh, an abandoned hospital in the morgue. Uh, these are the morgue drawers in the hospital. Uh, the basement of an abandoned hospital. They just blew this place up uh, last year. They imploded it. Um, that sounds terrible. You know, walking around in the dark. <laughs> yeah. With I agree. Flat Go ahead. What? I said that sounds terrifying to do night photography in an abandoned morgue. <laughs> yeah, it's creepy as hell. It's it's super creepy. This is uh, not when you have a light source that looks morgue. like a laser gun. <laughs> yeah, it's very Star Wars, right? Yeah, at at right. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so, you know, I mean, I, I, there's so many images in here. Here's a, one of the portraits. Uh, I, I teach workshops in, in a uh, junkyard in uh, the California desert, and I always do portraits of all the students. Uh, and it gives me a chance to, like, have a good one-on-one -on -one time with every student and, and also, like, end up getting some good portraits of people that way, and uh, everybody comes away happy. So, uh, you know, this kind of process with continuous source lights, like I say, almost impossible to do this with flashlights. Um, you know, you want me to give you a, a really a big tip here. It's, it's when you're doing night photography and you're out in the field and you're walking around and, and you're trying to set up shots, don't wear a headlamp. Don't wear a headlamp. The headlamp it, it puts the light source right next to your eyes and you see the world as if it's lit with on-camera flash. You follow that? It's yeah. the same idea, right? The light source is right next to where the image is, is being seen from. So it flattens the scene out. You can't really set up your shots or judge what you're shooting with a headlamp on. Plus, it drives everybody else that you're shooting with crazy because when you look them in the face to talk to them, it, it fries their eyes out. So that's my number one tip for people that are going out and doing my photography the first time is leave the headlamp in your trunk for when you get a flat tire on the side of the freeway. Perfect for that, but I would never use it when I'm not in the field during night shooting. So anyway... That's the uh, that's the book. I um, have another book that's coming up with with flat books. Uh, it's in process right now. It's called Boneyard, and it's all night work done in a uh, abandoned uh, not abandoned but in the uh, airplane graveyards. So it's all night work uh, in a couple of different uh, junkyards that I managed to finagle access to and, and get some night work done in great places, amazing so spots. So Troy, um, related to that, here's a question from Cape Cod Tim. <laughs> from uh, Massachusetts, he asks, uh, or he says, question for Troy, colon, out of all the abandoned places you shot, is there a location you wish you could go back to now that's gone, and why? Hmm. Wow. Yeah, they're almost all, so many of them are gone, you know. Uh, I'm going to go with uh, there's a, a, the Boneyard, the secret Boneyard in that new Boneyard book. Uh, that I that I mentioned in there, I never disclosed where the location is. That was part of the arrangement with the owner was that I, I wouldn't say where this place was. It's filled with World War II airplanes, the B fifty B twenty nines and B twenty fives and stuff. But it's a junkyard filled with this stuff. It's an amazing place. And the owner said you can't ever disclose where the site is. And I just tried to get back in there to shoot again, and he rejected me. So I'll never be able to go back to this place. So to me, that's like lost to me, and that's. Pretty depressing. I just learned that uh, right around New Year's when I tried to go back down there and do some more work. So mm. it's uh, you know it's it's tough. You know, doing this kind of work in these kind of locations, it, it's always so transitory and 
and you you know you see a neat cool thing to shoot, and you go back a month later to shoot it, and it's a vacant lot. It's happened to me many many times. So it's uh, you know it's just it's part of it. I love it. I love that about it. You know, it's, it's all fugitive. Yes. You know? Well, here's That's an inspiring a question. That's uh, come in, and this is kind of for anybody. Maybe Joseph, you can handle it. Um, this one, golly, it just jumped around again. It was oh, a question to all present photographers. This is from Taz M in Vancouver, British Columbia. Uh, sun flares are so annoying, and they come right in the perfect position that you wouldn't compromise. Any trick to get them out of the way? Question <laughs> mark. It's funny. I was actually just typing a response to them because I didn't know if that question was going to get answered. Um, yeah, I mean, lens flares, if you can't use it to your advantage, I personally quite often love lens flares. I think that if you get a nice flare and, and a good lens, you can get some really nice effects out of it, and you can use it to your advantage. But if you really, really need to kill it, I uh, start with a lens shade, of course. That's kind of one of the things that lens shades are designed for to keep the stray light from coming in. But if it's coming a little bit more at an angle that the lens shade won't do it, just find something to block it. If it's your hand or a, a book, a big piece of cardboard, or if you've got a pop-out reflector, use that. But a lens flare means that light is hitting your lens directly, so you just need to figure out where it's coming from and block it. Just put something between it. It doesn't have to be in the frame, obviously. Uh, clearly, you wouldn't want it in the frame. You want that blocking thing somewhere else that you can't see it in the shot. But just block that beam of light from hitting your lens, and the lens flare should go away. You, you could also, if you, if you don't have a big block and just use your hand, you can do two exposures, one with, uh, without your hand in it, one with your hand in it, blocking it, and then just mask in that area if you want to do some post-processing. Cool. Sure. Good idea, Justin. Good. I like that one. Yeah. Hey, Troy, could I ask you a quick question? Sure. Hey, that, um, how do you think, what do, you, do you like Lightroom 4 now with that white brush adjustment or the white balance brush adjustments with your light painting? Is that cool or not? White balance, I haven't used it. I don't know. I'm not a Lightroom user. I, I'm oh, okay. straight up Photoshop. I'm a straight up Photoshop. Okay, cool, cool. Well, then you already cool. have that. <laughs> um, yeah, but that, that sounds like an interesting thing. You know, I, I've always tried to avoid mixing white balance where you like have the, you know, the, the subject is 3,800K and then the background is 7,000K. I don't know. Right. I, to my eye, because the, the subject is always going to have light reflected in it and light bounced onto it. So if if you have this blue thing that has like blue light on it reflecting, which should be reflecting the gold background in some way, it should be picking that up. Oh, okay. Right. I actually found a use for it. There's a you have that in Aperture as well. The you can now brush in the white balance. Right. And it took me a while to find a shot because I was doing some training to show off how it would work, and it took me a while to find a shot where it made sense. But I found an old shot from a, a nighttime bike race that I shot years ago. And the lighting on the street was quite different than the lighting that was on the presenter stand. And gotcha. so I was able to use that brush to kind of balance that out and make it look a bit more even all the way across. Yeah, that'd be a good yeah. use for that. Yeah, that'd be a good use for that if you're in like a mixed lighting situation like that. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. For me, I always like to, well, look, the, that's all blue and then the, the subject's all yellow. That's kind, of interest, that's kind of interesting too, you know, if you're in that situation where it's, you know, but I guess if you have a client that you have to please and how come the lights are all different? I don't understand, you know. Yeah, I can see a lot of real estate photographers using it to balance, yeah. to mix, or mix light yeah. sources. Yeah, yeah there you go. There's an example of people that don't understand what they're looking at it most of the time anyway, so like, oh, it has to look like this <laughs> right? It's not normal, you know. Yeah, I yeah. think I'm with you, Troy. Whenever I, it comes to white balancing something, sometimes the colors are so crazy in a weird situation that nothing makes sense, so I just kind of keep moving stuff around until I think it looks pretty. <laughs> Roll with it. <laughs> yeah, until it, it, feel, it just has to feel right, you know? It yeah. just has to feel right. I remember printing this kind of work back in the film era, and, and you know, you just you give, a, you know, a, a purple gelled image with a blue sky to a lab and tell them to print it without giving them any directions. And, you, and you, it would come back, and the sky would be purple, and, and the, the subject would be green. It would be completely different than what the original image looked like, the original transparency. It's kind of funny, you know? I mean, nowadays, yeah, everybody can control all this stuff themselves. But back in the old days, man, you, it was a total crapshoot as to what you were going to get. And they, you know, they had no idea what they were reading, you know. So yeah. we all have it so good now. We 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 don't. People don't realize. People that have gotten into photography in the last five years, how much easier it is now 
to handle all this stuff and juggle all these different aspects of it. It's so cool. I love it. So cool. All right. Well, I'll, I'll go last here in order. Let me share this. This, this book is part of the, the bundle that I mentioned. Uh, this one is, is one of mine. So let me share this. It's called um, The Beauty of Ambiguity. And um, I'll just tell you about it very briefly here. Uh, so this is a, a, a special, uh, this is my latest one that I've done, and it has um, a lot of uh, um, thoughts about, uh, you know, digital photography and human perception and, and these sorts of things. And there's lots of little smaller topics in here, mostly built around, I think, how the brain has learned to interpret images differently just in the past few years. Because, <laughs> like, in this example, you know, I think maybe 10, 20, 30 years ago, we'd open up a National Geographic magazine and then there would be an image. and We could just stare at it, you know, for 30 seconds or a minute and then you would like grok it slowly over that time and really appreciate it. But now, I think something has happened and our brains have kind of rewired themselves thanks to things like Google Plus and just the internet in general, 500px and Flickr is that our brains are now so fast at assessing the nature of an image that you can look at an image and grok it and completely understand it in like two or three seconds. It's kind of sad, in fact. There's all these great photos. I can look at photos from the other authors here, and even though it might be like, even though Troy might put up an amazing photo, I could actually look at it and get it, you know, very, very quickly, which is, which is shocking, actually. But I actually find that um, I'm interested in certain kinds of photos I notice that certain kinds of photos I, I look at for longer. And I notice that the photos that I look at for longer are those that have mistakes or ambiguous parts or mysteries in them. So more and more I am trying to have as much uh, mystery and ambiguity in my photos as possible. Because sometimes if everything is too literal and you just put it all out there, then there's nothing left to the imagination. It might be like a very technically interesting photo, but if there's zero left to the imagination, then I think people will only look at your photo for three or four or five seconds. And I think that if people hang out there for 10, 20, 30 seconds, what's happening is their, their imagination and their own creativity is trying to fill in your mystery. Anyway, I don't totally understand this, but I think there's, there's something there. And this is sort of the last, last page I'll show. And I, I talk in here a lot about this guy named Leonard Bernstein who wow. uh, created a series of uh, videos when he was lecturing at Harvard Yard in the round uh, to all these uh, young students who were interested in his, uh, uh, in his thoughts on musical composition. Anyway, the whole thing is about music and whatnot, which I know very little about, but I listened to it uh, enraptured. But I think it was, a lot of his comments also work in the realm of art and photography. And so that whole idea of sometimes making things less clear uh, make them more interesting. And this is counterintuitive to me. I don't totally understand it, but I do toy with it. Sometimes I have things that are perfectly clear, and I, I do like them, and they are interesting. Sometimes I, I have things that are not clear, and they are also very interesting. So, you know, there's an indirect relationship between clarity and interestingness. And so, anyway, I talk a lot about this in the in this little ebook. All right. So let me unscreen share. And now we can do just some fast picture sharing time. Kind of, we've kind of gone a little long, so we can kind of rapid fire through it. Um, I don't know if everyone brought photos or not. I know, I know you did, Karen. Do you want to go for it? Sure. I'm happy to do that. Um, and if anyone else brought a few photos they want to you know, go through real quick, just uh, drop me a, a little chat message over there on the right and we'll kind of go through them. I actually wanted to pull this one up because this is the one that we were talking about from the Nick thing the other day. This is I, this was on a really gray day. We are talking about the um, what do you do with the gray skies, the person in Edmonton. I do stuff like this instead. <laughs> um, so on really gray days, try to avoid the sky and try to find the really interesting things and then, you know, 
uh, it was pretty interesting, raw, but then it was more interesting when I got done with it, with, you know, with processing and so on and so forth. But anyway, this, these are the photos that I was going to um, just kind of whip through really quick because they're recent. I've been shooting a lot of ice because there's been, <laughs> well, it was 19, minus 19 degrees Fahrenheit the other night, which is unusual for here. It doesn't do that really as a rule, nor for any length of time. But all kinds of interesting things happen when it does, like this. Um, I went out in a snowstorm to shoot a little... Uh, little train, little actually Christmas in Truckee, but uh, the train came through and very conveniently stopped. So I ran across the street without falling down and went and took a picture of it because I thought it was cool. It's incredible. I love that photo. Thanks. I loved it too. It was like this, the headlights, it's the headlights going through the um, snow. It was a snowstorm, full-on windy, blowing snowstorm, and I loved it. It was really fun. Um, this was the other falls picture from the same area. Again, avoiding the sky and finding interesting things. And it was a very gray day, but um, if you have some depth, there's there's like uh, some shadows and some light you can really play with and bring out on those days as well. And then some sea lions. I just love them. I just thought they were amusing and uh, a little smelly, but really That's amusing. Yeah. I know. They're. Uh, <laughs> They're big, man. The, the big males get up to 4,000 pounds. Wow. Barry Blanchard took me down to see sea lions. He loves them. He shoots them. It's around. amazing how they can get up on the rocks, too. <laughs> I know. They're, they're, they're very... Uh, they look so benign here, but yeah. they're really not. They're kind of aggressive and interesting. This one I have not posted yet from another minus below sub-zero morning, which I just thought was... Beautiful. Fun. Thank you. And then I haven't posted this one either yet, um, which oh, I wow. liked. The magical forest. So there you have it. That's me. Sorry, I've been. Uh, uh, Tom wants to share a photo. He came, he's been processing over there in the easy chair. <laughs> so you, you, come, you come in last. You can. We'll close the show with your. He doesn't think it's worth sharing. He thinks there's too many. You can zoom in and show the details. <laughs> Okay, so uh, it looks like Paul has one to share. Go for it, Paul. All right, yeah, I have to go mobile to show you this one. But okay. um, basically, Bring it, Paul. Uh, many of you may already know. Um, most of you probably don't, but I recently did a Kickstarter project successfully, and that was to make the the first body paint hologram. And so that's a three D. Dimensional, um, without glasses or without any sort of stereoscopic tricks, and so it's done. So I have it here in my hallway, and I want to show it to oh. you. So this is it. Oh here, wow! And you can see as I move left to right, the perspective changes. Oh wow! 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 You can look up above and see a little bit more of her headpiece, and That's it's really body cool. paint. I'll try to get up oh, close. Oh. And obviously, this stuff is best seen in person, and it has a pretty, it's pretty detailed too. But uh, it I have, looks uh, pretty good on video, actually. It doesn't look too bad. It looks good. Yeah. Wow, that's awesome. And so it's framed on the wall like any piece of art, lit by a halogen bulb on the ceiling and a track lighting. That is so amazing. And um, there's more details about it on my website videos and a little bit of the time lapse of me painting her. But it was a successful project that I pulled God, off, which was pretty yeah. exciting. That is very cool. Excellent. Very, very cool. Okay, uh, going in order of who responded, uh, Krista says, sure, I can share one. All right, let me show you. Um, okay, so this is one. <laughs> Lizard, can you see it? Yep. Oops. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so this is full screen. It messes up now and oh, okay. Hangouts. Got it. No full screen. Yeah. Oops. Oh, it totally disappeared, didn't it? Okay. Well, you saw the lizard for a second. This is another one that I was actually meaning to click on. This is one I took this weekend. Um, one of my first um, kind of longer exposure ones. And so this is Love downtown that. Arlington. Um, and uh, it was it was fun to get try to get these. Bursts on there, and I learned 
if you want bursts, you've got to do the really narrow aperture to get some diffraction. So that was fun. Pursuit so, of uh, mastery. That's right. That's right. <laughs> awesome. Um, and I might have, or, I don't know, uh, I'll just, yeah, so you can see the rest of my photos on, on my page. There you go. Cool. Excellent. Cool. Uh, next, uh, Joseph says he's ready. All righty. Let's make sure I got the right window here. Um, see, we're only doing a couple, so I will uh, skip a lot of these. But one of the things I've been is my screen up now. We yeah. One of the things I've been really uh, excited about lately is black and white photography and looking for photos that you wouldn't normally maybe think of as black and white. Uh, so this is actually shot in a wild animal park here in Oregon. If you can believe that. Um, beautiful line, just kind of sitting there checking out, smelling the daisies. But when I converted it to black and white, I thought the image was just so much stronger. Just a really, really interesting look for it. And I think that kind of the moral of this is really just don't don't disregard black and white. You know, there's so much when you take away the color, there's so much texture that you can find in there that you may not have seen otherwise. And I use Nick Silver FX Pro 2, which I think is just amazing for black and white conversions. I know there's uh, several different tools out there, but that's the one that I use, and I just absolutely love what you can get out of that. So that's the first one, and the next one I'm going to show, this is a bit of a, an oddball thing here. So I have my hands right now on a camera that's a little bit dis disturbing. It is the Leica S2. It's the medium what? format. I know. <laughs> Whoa. Format. That's a limited uh, audience for books. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. I know I will not be doing a book on this. Uh, if I did, I'll charge you know as much for the book as the, the camera costs. No, it's, uh, it's this insane. It's a $30,000 thinking camera. That's just for the body. It's a medium format and a DSLR type body. Anyway, so I've got one on loan for a little while. And um, I went out the last couple of days and did some photography in, on the Oregon coast. And so the shot on the left here that you see is straight out of the camera, which, as you can see, is really nothing that exciting, that special about it. And when I stopped at this particular spot, it was one of these, you know, you're driving and you see something, oh, that's amazing. You jump out and you get the camera and then you go, mm, it really isn't quite as exciting as I thought. So I shot the image on the left and kind of went, eh, whatever. And then this one on the very right was shot with my iPhone because I was, every stop I shot some with my <laughs> iPhone and I threw it into Instagram. Yay! And, uh, oh, I love iPhone photography. So I <laughs> you know, threw it into Instagram and I shared it right away. And looking at it later, I thought, man, that picture was really quite cool, right? So there's, there's the iPhone picture. I love that picture, but the Leica picture was a bit drab. So then I went into Nick's uh, Color Effects Pro 4, and I basically tried to reproduce the color bleeding and color saturation and everything else, and um, it worked. <laughs> and what's really amazing, this, so this, the photo on the right is an HDR. It's just the you know, iPhone HDR, and so you get the highlights and you get some detail in the shadows here. This Leica file is just sick in the detail that you get. Let me see if I can zoom out to... This is the 36-something megapixel file. But in the original, all of this is completely blown out, but it, the data was all there. So it's almost HDR-esque in its dynamic wow. range, from the darkest shadows to the brightest highlights. And this is just a single file, and pulled in just an amazing amount of detail there. So... No, obviously this camera is not for everyone, and I'm going to be very sad when I have to send this back. But, um, but yeah, that's... Uh, it's kind of a lot of fun. So if you get your hands on one of these things, I highly recommend it. <laughs> cool. We'll wait till they're in the refurbished section at B&H for like $250. Yeah, that'll, that'll be a while. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the photos. All right, I'm who is next? It is Justin. Yeah, this, uh, I just want to show you two quick photos for actually my next flat books fo uh, book I'm working on. It's um, a little personal project I'm doing with try to shorten the story. But anyways, everybody probably knows professional cycling has got a pretty black eye right now. Um, and so I have a personal project going on. I'm a longtime bike racer and I wanted to re-envision bicycle racing because it's my favorite sport of all time. I, I ride all the time. I love it. So I approached one of the riders in the Peloton to write a book with me about the race that's here in Colorado called the U.S. Pro Cycling Challenge. And I shoot a lot of bike racing, so he agreed to ride it with me. And so I was going to show you two photos from it. Here we go. So I'm trying to bring a new twist to bike racing, and um, this is one of the photos I will be in the book, and um, it's divided up kind of from the fan's perspective. Called, it's like a behind-the-scenes look, and this was shot with a uh, Nikon D700 and a 300-millimeter lens. That's George Hincappy after a long day in the race getting interviewed at the um, finish line. 
But then the, the, the other one I wanted to show you is just from the media car, just how crazy the fans are along the side of the road, and that's what bike racing is all about. So there will be a lot of those images in there, but uh, it'll be a fun book, and I, I'm looking forward to getting it published there in flat books. So there you go. I know we're short on time, so I'll, I'll close it out. Very cool. Okay, Troy, go for it. Oh, 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 oh let me go screen share here. Uh, let's just go desktop. I'll show you a couple of images um, that are uh, uh, new things that I don't think people have seen very much yet. This is uh, one of the new images that's in the, uh, the upcoming Boneyard book. This is a wow. 747 fuselage that had been uh, torn up and then burned as a movie prop uh, in the back lot of this uh, airplane graveyard. Uh, in a high desert, always clouds blowing through. You can see I had the North Star in the center there with the other stars circling around the, uh, the North Star in the background. Uh, it's relatively short exposure, probably four minutes, long enough to get some good cloud movement, uh, but not so long that you're tying up your camera for half the night because Everyone knows there's. It's never just four minutes. You know, it's four minutes for that final exposure. That doesn't include all the other setup shots and the walking around trying to set the thing up. Uh, airplane graveyards are like the, the coolest places in the world. I love them. Um, this one was shot last uh, time I t taught a workshop at Paul's Junkyard. Uh, this is a forty mid forties um, Chevy pickup truck uh, cut off at the cab so that the nose is way up in the air. Had the camera sitting on a, a rock to shoot this. The camera was only uh, I don't know six inches off the ground, uh, and I propped it up. I think it was actually a piece of metal that I propped it up on. I uh, lit it with that proto machine flashlight straight down on the grill from just out of the top of the camera, and then snooted light on the headlights. And you can see I got a little bit of purple bleed here in the headlights, but I don't mind that so much. My main concern was just grazing the front of this to get these nice deep shadows and still being able to pull these nice highlights and do it fast enough so that the moon didn't rise into the shot. You can dawdle for a long time and have the moon all of a sudden pop into the shot and ruin the setup. I also crossed behind the uh, driver's side tire here uh, and did some blue lighting as well to throw some light on what's going on beneath the bumper. But I really wanted the, the, the nose and eyes of this thing to really be with uh, what was the happening thing about it. This one was shot a uh, couple of months ago. This is like 45 minutes. Uh, that's why the star trails are so long. Uh, and uh, I was shooting with another photographer, and he was in the trailer and doing light painting and throwing light on the windows inside the trailer. So I just left the, the shutter open and let him light paint it for me. He, I, I had no control over what was going on with that red light inside the trailer, but it worked out fine. The only issue was that there was a guy living in a little shack just off the camera right here, and he came out when we first showed up with his shotgun and racked the shotgun and said, what are you guys doing out here on my property? You know, pitch dark, 11 o'clock at night. Scared the hell out of the poor guy. But I had images in the phone, and I uh, was able to talk my way through it. But, you know, you smell the liquor on his breath, and, you know, it's uh, always exciting being a knife photographer every day. I, uh, I strongly no. recommend it. Um, the last uh, time I did a workshop, also, uh, one of the students brought this doll. I didn't usually go in wow. for props and, and that sort of thing, but he brought this doll. It was right around Halloween, so I'm not right? So he brought this doll, and he had it painted up with, uh, you know, just regular house paint. And uh, so I carried her around for half a night with her tucked under my arm and propped her up in uh, a bunch of different spots in the junkyard to, to uh, that's a nice portrait of it. Nice. You can use continuous source light, but it's still a human figure, so people respond to it as a human as a human subject, even though it's obviously a doll. Uh, but again, it's all in how you light it. There's a little bit of a little bit of bounce purple light on her face, which you can see in the shadows, but it was lit with white light from directly down on her, which also enhanced the shadows of her eye sockets. Uh, and then I backlit everything. This is a uh, movie prop subway car at uh, Paul's Junkyard. Uh, I did another portrait of her. Nobody's seen this one yet. This is uh, in, uh, next to a crashed uh, mail truck. Uh, and again, lighting her is about lighting straight down with 
you know, it's, it's with the scary, lighting scary stuff, you know, you want to make a person look spooky, light them straight down or straight up, and, uh, and you can't move. And put them in a sailor suit, I figured. I think it's probably pretty important. <laughs> so, yeah, that's what's, that's what's uh, been going on lately. Those are great. Anyway. Yeah. I love your work. So, it's so yeah. much like Fallout. Have you have you played the game Fallout before? Yeah, I, yeah. I have. Yeah. And, and a lot of I get a lot of I get a lot of video game. Wow, this is like a first person shooter, you know. And uh, you know, a lot of people come shooting at me, and they'll say, you know, wow, man, where's the zombies? You know, so wandering around in you know abandoned military bases and you know ghost towns in the middle of the night. It's it's creepy and spooky, you know. It's definitely a, a vibe. So I try to. Bring Bring that in work in the speaking video as I possibly can too. All right, cool. Thank you. I'll share some yeah. quick, kind of unprocessed ones, and these are all taken uh, today. So uh, I haven't really, you know, I need more time to fully process them, but these, I pulled these into Lightroom and did like a minute's worth of adjustments. So have a low expert. You can kind of, you're sort of seeing sausage in the middle of being made. So have low. <laughs> Expectations. All right, so uh, Tom and I went to this awesome place today called The Hills. It's this really cool country club in uh, in Queenstown, and they have this incredible. Uh, I wouldn't even call it a statue because it's like a hundred statues of this of these wolves attacking this samurai. And so I'm going to show you like four different images, and I'll kind of pull out so you get a sense of the scale of this thing. Uh, can you see that right now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, good. So I'll scale out one more notch. Uh, this is a little bit uh, further away. Um, every one of these uh, wolves is just awesome. They have these big, thick tails. They're all individually posed. Actually, I need to, you can tell how early this is because you can see our golf cart over there on the right. I think the... The uh, uh, and the uh, I think the, uh, the pro at the golf course thought we were strange because we went and got a golf cart and then we didn't go with any clubs. We just took our our cameras. Okay, so that's that. And then we zoomed out one more. Uh, this is a little further away still. Um, you kind of get a, a sense of it. And then uh, we had a helicopter pick us up, and this is a view from the helicopter, so you can kind of oh, get a wow. sense of just how awesome this is. And apparently this guy, they, they bought this from a famous uh, sculptor in Beijing and they came to set it up in a, uh, a different place on the golf course. But he didn't like it. He goes, this will not do. And he found a new place and they had everything moved over here. These things just weigh tons and tons. So anyway, I don't really like any of these shots in particular. I want to go back and get them in the mist or sunrise or sunset or at night or Maybe I'll um, follow Troy insane. and light paint these things up. Oh, or God. I'm like drooling, thinking of how much fun it would be to light this stuff. Yeah, hey, come on <laughs> over, Troy. We'll go out and we'll light paint this thing. Yeah, and man, then, theater, you know? Theater yeah, theater here's, style. yeah, here's the last one. My mom will not like this. I know my mom watches the show. Uh, so we landed the helicopter on top of this mountain, and I did a headstand on the edge of this thing, and that's, that's Tom down there taking my picture. <laughs> God. <laughs> That came from your yeah, the, the helicopter pilot took this photo. Her name is That's Choppy. <laughs> <laughs> That's better than my Her natural born yeah. name. That's so cool. <laughs> 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 All right. I didn't approve of that either. Yeah. I think uh, yeah, it's, it's more dangerous than it looks. This, that's not tr that's not trick stupidity. That's real stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> that, like it looks like oh maybe he could fall you know three feet. No, <laughs> he fell. He was dead. Yeah, the, all, the show almost didn't happen today. <laughs> um, Dang. Yeah. So we were able to get do this. Uh, so since I survived, everyone should go buy this this ebook bundle and. Bingo. Uh, <laughs> Let's celebrate, let's celebrate my life. And uh, <laughs> you guys can go buy ebooks from these authors. Um, so, we should do, we're running late. I apologize. I contributed to the lateness, of course, with this nonsense. But let's quickly go through our Google Plus photographer discoveries. Everyone has those ready, yes? Yes, we do. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Uh, let's go um, right to left. We'll start with you, Troy. Oh, go left or right then, if that's the case. Okay, Krista. Okay, 
So, um, my photographer find is Noah. I met him at a DC photo walk, and he actually took some awesome shots of me recently, and I'm a bit of a narcissist, so I'll have to show those. But, um, <laughs> so, there's, uh, there's some cool shots that he took. Um, I really love this one. And um, he's actually, whoops, he's really good at some macro work um, and just getting started with photog uh, portrait work. This is one of his awesome macro shots is this little dragonfly up here that will load. Whoops. Oh. I guess it lost it. There. Do you see it? Wow. Yeah, I really love this. Wowie, wow, wow. It's up so That's uh, Noah Urban. Very, very All right, very cool. good. So who is next? Uh, Joseph. All righty. Um, this fellow, so I found this guy. I was looking for black and white because, I, as I said earlier, I love black and white. This guy's name is uh, Johan, oh, where did it go? Johan Swanepoel. He is from South Africa, and he does some amazing wildlife photography. So let me just pull up some of these here. And he's got some black and whites and some color, of course. Um, but as you can see here, that's, wow. that's kind of wicked awesome. And I don't think this was taken in a little park like my lion picture here in, uh, here in Oregon. But, yeah, just, I mean, look at that. That's just stunning. So he's got something like 60,000 followers, so it's not like he's an unknown photographer, but he's clearly got some absolutely gorgeous work, and I hadn't seen it until today. So quite uh, quite pleased with what I've seen there. So Johan Swanepoel, uh, S-W-A-N-E-P-O-E-L. Those are gorgeous. Isn't that just great? That's wow. crazy. I love Every time I think the... about taking up animal photography, I see stuff like that, I'm like, forget it. <laughs> I know what you mean. Yeah. 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 Okay, Justin, go for it. Oh, yeah. Um, let me do a quick screen share here. Um, hmm. Does it make any difference if it's in the same tab, or does it need to be in a new window? Shouldn't make any difference. No? Sorry. He's a... He's a um, so you don't have to screen share. You can just tell us the name, and we'll make. Oh it yeah, over. you can yeah. check them out. The reason I wanted to screen share is I just show you the one photo. I've been getting some information on Iceland. Actually, Trey, you've kind of inspired me to go check out Iceland. It seems pretty awesome up there. Cool. Um, but this guy, Derek Kind, I believe is his name, and uh, he posted this photo of an Iceland horse. A lot of people do that. Can you see it? Yeah. Yes. And. Uh, I, I replied to him with, I've never been attracted to a horse before. Um, that's just an amazing <laughs> photograph. So um, he's been giving me some cool information about Iceland. Uh, you should check him out. He's uh, spent a couple months up there, has some really cool photos, and uh, has some very attractive horses. So there you go, Derek Kind, D-E-R-E-K-K-I-N-D. Awesome. Yep. He's cool. awesome. Yay. So there you go. Karen, go for it. Okay. Okay, boom, boom. My share is Mark Hammon, H A M M O N. <clears throat> he does, um, <clears throat> pardon me, he does, this is actually from Burning Man, which I love. He's kind of does uh, a lot of um, landscape that I really enjoy. He's um, up here in Reno, Nevada. Nice. Shoots the Sierras <clears throat> just beautifully. Uh, I just really love the stuff that he does. Here and then today, so like you know, he's all Mr. Landscape and this and that. And then I just wanted to show you. So today he posts this, which blew my mind, and I absolutely love it. And he said, "Oh, this is something I've been wanting to do. This is in my mind for a long time." <laughs> like, because most landscape photographers have that in their mind. <laughs> and I, of course, love surreal fantasy kinds of um, photography. So. I just really enjoy Mark because he's just he's done it for a long time and he's a just a really solid solid photographer. Mark Hammon. I gotta show you I gotta show you the cows. I love the cows. And then I'll stop. Cows. <laughs> I don't know why, they just crack me up. <laughs> okay, I'm done. Cool. 
Uh, hey, how did you get that full screen, by the way? We've been having trouble doing that. She's sharing space her bar. old desktop. Space oh, bar. Desktop. Okay, I yeah, got space bar. Okay, I Paul. Just, you hit space bar in the, in the photo albums. Yeah. I, uh, I actually, for some reason, thought I was supposed to find an artist, so I picked a painter. <laughs> That's cool. It's, it suits It suits me, right? Let me just pop up the screen. I love seeing other artists. Like you say, I always get really inspired by... It's, you know what? Athletes cross-train, so I think artists should, too. Totally. Absolutely. Absolutely. I always, stress, we... that. I always stress that with uh, yep. any students that I'm talking to. It's yep. inspired I found by music this... and paintings and sculpture and everything. Why not? I found this guy uh, via Al Ebnereza. He pointed him out to me, and I was pretty pretty blown away. Uh, his name is Johan Bodin, J O H A double N, last name B O D I N, and he's got some pretty amazing painting. He does both painting um, traditionally and digitally, but um, we lost these are some of his. There. Oh, you don't see it? Uh -uh. We lost it. We did, and then it went away. All right, one second. Let me try it again. Yeah, don't don't go full screen if you're only sharing the window because it'll wipe it out. Okay. All right. All right. So that's um. These are the digital paintings. Do you see them now? Mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, wow. These are some of the digital paintings, and they're pretty wow. wild. Wow. Mm. Don't look at those late at night. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to sleep. Yeah. Wow. That's really fascinating. Does he? Do you know if he starts with? Um, an image and then paints on top of it, or does he just uh, paint directly? I'm not sure. I don't. To me, if I had to guess, I'd say he he doesn't start with an image. It looks like he does a lot of it right mm -hmm. from from his mind. He might use one as a reference, maybe, but wow. looks to me like it's pretty legit. Hmm. But Johann Bodin. Beautiful. Wow. Amazing. Very cool. Okay, Troy. Oh yes, indeed. Thanks for coming back to me. Um. Let's see. Let's go with this guy, uh, Hunter Luisi. Uh, night photographer does a lot of HDR stuff at night, which I, I'm my mind boggles at the idea of doing multiple exposures and combining them with night work. It's like seems like so much extra work to me, but he comes up with some really beautifully delicate, soft imagery. Really nice things. So Hunter Luisi, L-U-I-S-I. Good one. Okay, my share is, uh, my discovery is Paul Pavlinovich. He's from Melbourne, and he's a super nice guy. He was uh, just a, he helped with the photo walk, and they have one of the most active photo walk communities of any community I've ever run into. And I think really? it's uh, in a big part uh, because of Paul and some of these other people that uh, help out with that community is just really incredible. So um, I think we'll probably end up doing another show about that Melbourne photo walk and share a lot of photos that people took from the event and, and talk about the city and that sort of thing because it was just a tremendously fun uh, situation. I think uh, I haven't really looked at it, but he put up a post that says there was a world record that uh, they, the preliminary count was that 289 people showed up. So uh, it's just amazing. These uh, they're very enthusiastic, very kind, curious people. So it was uh, it's a really cool crowd. So so follow him, and through him, you'll meet a lot of other um, Australian photographers. I think it's good to get a, a good mix in there. All right. Yep. Okay. So that is it. Um, any any uh, final words from any of these wonderful authors here? Any get out and take some pictures, questions? everybody, especially at night. Get out. And <laughs> Just go, man. Go. Get out there. Justin, you always have words of wisdom that you can pass on on the tip of a hat. <laughs> well, it's been a great night. Um, no, uh, no. Go out and take pictures at night with your phone. Get out there. <laughs> Just take pictures. Have fun. Exactly. Yes. Just get out there and, and stop talking about it and go out and do it. You know. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Get, well, get people thanks naked again, and painting. all you great authors. Thanks and for uh, for writing these amazing books. I hope uh, the world gets to enjoy them as, as much as we as we've enjoyed them. And uh, anyway, thank you very much. It's been very cool. And thank you to Flat you. Books for taking a chance on all of us. Yeah, man. 
Yep. That's, of course. Been, Agreed. That's been phenomenal. Thank you. Yes. Well, hey, we're all in this together, so I'm I'm happy and excited about it. All right. Yay. Cool. All right, guys. Okay. Well, thanks everyone for watching. Right, good night. Yes, good Karen. Night, everybody. No, no, no. I was just saying goodbye. Good okay. Bye, Karen. Bye. Bye. Bye, everyone. Aloha.